from the uh, broken perspective of him, like his flaws and you know mental illness, if you can call it a thing. Go ahead and clap for me. Thank you. Rob and I are both atheists, and Rob and I are both atheists, and as as atheists, we believe that our consciousnesses are creations of biological organisms. And the only reason that we can think and feel and love and hate is because it was evolutionarily beneficial for us to do that. And as soon as the organism dies, there's no more reason for the consciousness. And the consciousness dies too. And fundamentally, from a, from a Christian worldview, that doesn't exist. Because uh, either everybody goes to heaven or some little sects say that uh, everybody goes to heaven except the ones who go to hell and those ones are destroyed, you know? Or, of course, the, a lot of people think a lot of people burn in hell. And, but that's still life, you know? And they, there's, there's very few religions that are saying people just don't live after they die. They, there's reincarnation or there's a heaven or a hell or something. There's a purgatory, you know? But atheists don't have that. And so either you just accept it and you say, yes, I'm going to die. That's going to happen to me. And nothing I can do about it, you know? I've, I've got, what, so many decades left? Am I really going to count those? Or am I going to say, I'm going to live, and if I die, then I die, you know? And that's just game over. Okay, Alexander the Great, he died at, what, 32, 33, something like that? Conquered the whole world. You know, he conquered the, and he was a king to begin with, but I mean, we're, we're not going to do that, you know, and we wouldn't want to, but it's a, you, you just can't aspire to that. And that guy didn't live a very long life by modern standards, you know, lived a lot better life than I'm ever going to live. Rob and I are both atheists. As atheists, we believe that our consciousnesses are creations of biological organisms. And the only reason that we can think and feel and love and hate is because it was evolutionarily beneficial for us to do that. And as soon as the organism dies, there's no more reason for the consciousness. And the consciousness dies too. I saw Rob probably two weeks after he came back to Springfield because he was just so holed up in his room that he didn't want to see anybody. It was like sitting next to an abused child, you know, who was completely traumatized. He creates fantastic, beautiful things when he's at his best. And when he's at his worst, uh, the same energy is applied. Rob plays Nintendo like some men play guitars. about dying and the fact that falling asleep felt like dying to him. My medical background would have told me I knew he had the beginnings of PTSD. He was dealing with his PTSD by basically locking into something that was taking every inch of his attention span and his motivation and pushing it into a digital realm. It was the ultimate form of escapism, the most damaging kind of escapism. Transition that into, um, I think you nailed it as far as like the fear of death or anything. Transition that into Rob. Okay. Um, how, does, how does it affect him? Because it seems like you understand it. When Rob is laying in bed at night, he has to sit there and worry that maybe he won't wake up. That's a thing. He, he just, what if I don't? What if I die in the middle of the night and I never wake up in the morning again? And then I'm just not a person. 
And that's, that's not something that a Christian has to deal with, you know? And it's, a, it's, it's just a totally, it's a different take on the world. It's a different take on what life is. It's a different take on uh, the chances that you can take. And yet, Rob is still the guy who runs back into the burning plane crash. You know, and so he's able to overcome this when he needs to. It's not like he's going to freak out. It's not like he's going to not deal with the situation if it arises. But at the same time, it's going to haunt him. You know, and he's going to—he's. It's going to take him a while to get back on a plane, and he's going to—he's going to have to lay awake at night for a long time. You know, and uh, that's—that is the product of Rob not being able to overcome his fear of death. And it's, it's funny to me that, uh, it's funny to me that Rob uses, it's funny to me that Rob sees his uh, playing video games for a while as helping with his anxiety because it gave him some sort of outlet to uh, escape from it essentially. Um, because studies have shown that in young males, um, much younger than Rob, but I expect that it has the same effect on Rob. In young males, uh, playing violent video games will increase your aggression levels. And it just makes people more stressed out and more aggressive. And I haven't noticed Rob act that way in response to video games, but I can't help but think that it probably is affecting him on some level that he's not even aware of. When Rob is laying in bed at night, he has to sit there and worry that maybe he won't wake up. That's a thing. He, he just, what if I don't? What if I die in the middle of the night and I never wake up in the morning again? And then I'm just not a person. I think if a person hasn't questioned taking their own life at least once in their, over the course of their existence, I don't know if they really get it. I don't know if they really get the sick joke that is existence. It's, we are so lucky that we are the ones who survive. We are the ones who exist but there's just so many dark things in this world. It's a different take on the world. It's a different take on what life is. It's a different take on the chances that you can take. And yet, Rob is still the guy who runs back into the burning plane crash, you know? And so he's able to overcome this when he needs to, but at the same time, it's gonna haunt him. I don't think he's the kind of person that could ever raise a family and, and have a wife. Not that he doesn't have the love or the ability, but. I don't think that he he has the stability in his own mind to do that. That is the product of Rob not being able to overcome his fear of death. And so either you just accept it and you say, yes, I'm going to die. That's going to happen to me. And nothing I can do about it. I've got, what, so many decades left? Am I really gonna count those? Or am I gonna say, I'm gonna live, and if I die, then I die. It's not for nothing. I think that there is literally no chance that evolution is not selected for violent, aggressive behaviors in mankind. Now, the flip side of that coin is that evolution is also selected for caring behaviors. It's also selected for people setting up big parties and inviting all their friends over and feeding them all and having that great group camaraderie atmosphere. And we're doing both. We're sitting there and we're shooting at each other, but then we're also getting together and eating pizza. And it's a big communal thing. I think that there's a give and a take. We're all saints and sinners. We all have things that we don't want to tell anybody else because it's a deep, dark secret that we're ashamed of. We all have that. And we also have good things that we've done for people and never taken credit for and never, never bothered to say, yes, I'm the person who did that because we did it for the sake of doing it. I suspect that Rob's experiences throughout life, the hard times that he's gone through, the PTSD that he's dealt with and things, have probably shown him just kind of what, what the misery can be like, you know, and what that pain can be like. And once you've been there, it's really hard to not want to help other people out of it. He doesn't believe in, in God or going to church, but since he's afraid of death because he doesn't believe in that, he also ends up creating this 
group of people who believe in essentially the same ideals that come together weekly to hang out and participate in those ideals. So I just think it's kind of ironic. The one thing that breaks my heart more than anything else in the world is SETI. Because SETI is pointing their telescopes at the sky and recording and waiting and just hoping that we're going to hear an alien civilization cry out in the night and tell us that yes, they're here too. They're having this experience. They are trying to spread life and with it truth and beauty throughout the universe. And SETI hasn't found that. All these years that they've been looking, they have not found any trace of alien life. And before that, we, we couldn't say, you know? But now, we're looking, and maybe we're looking in the wrong band. Maybe there's something way more advanced that we're not looking at. Or maybe we just haven't looked at enough specks in the night sky yet, because there's a lot that we have not, you know? That, that's a big sky. But so far, we haven't found anything. And the more that we find nothing, the more likely it is that life on Earth, in a way that breeds intelligent species that are thinking about these things are rare. And the more rare they are, the more, I mean, it's not important because from, from my worldview, there isn't really importance. You know, there isn't, it's a, it's a human concept, but I care about it anyway, you know? And I think most people do. And uh, to me, it seems more important that we uh, concert our efforts and that we try to, um, to not let terrible empires exploit little tiny nations, and that we try to uh, move together as a species to uh, make this world better and then to spread to new worlds. Cones and rods. Cones and rods. His eyes are bleeding from their cones and rods and no, he can't see by the dawn's early light cause there's a crack in his mask that he got in the fight and the gas passed through the glass on the right side and he collapsed as his comrades fought and died. But here lies not the end of this fictional struggle for when our hero comes to, he will search through the rubble, stock up on ammo and go looking for trouble with the government. An unrelenting corporate juggernaut hell-bent on profit motives and determined to not stop. But these conspiracies our hero sees and will not tolerate. He will not stand down to a fascist state. He will not back down till the people create a better society. This is intoxicating fiction, but let's get back to sobriety. Not one of you pussies has such radical piety. I mean, you hipsters aren't exactly of the rioting variety like our hero. You killed exactly zero politicians, and I'm wishing it weren't the case, but I'm afraid Orwell was wrong about the proletariat race. There is no hope in the proles. There is no hope in the proles. The more I read, the more I see there is no hope in the proles. The more I read, the more I see what Aldous Huxley knows. Yeah, I know that he knows which way the wind blows as it carries the airwaves of shit TV shows. And you select which shit with your controls and there's a button marked power. But your finger won't go there. You just sit in your chair with that blank fucking stare and then you ask, where is the change? And I find it strange that this question is asked by a radical who idly sits on his ass watching campaign ads paid for by gas companies as they buy politicians with their dirty money and it's all plain to see and it's all happening right behind you. Because when you watch TV, they don't need tear gas to blind you. Cones and rods. Cones and rods. Your eyes are bleeding from their cones and rods. And as I look around this room, man, what do I see? It's a pair of bloody eyes staring back at me. It's our hero, and he's calling me a hypocrite. Says, if I want a revolution, then I should do it, because I talk a big game, but I ain't done shit to prove it. Yet. Cones and rods. Cones and rods. My eyes are bleeding from their cones and rods.